Hello everyone. Welcome to today's new beauty and still live. This is sponsored with Mentor and they are a great partner and someone that we have a wonderful relationship with because it is incredible what they bring to the table in terms of breast augmentation, which is what our topic is going to be about today. So we're going to discuss the process of breast augmentation and we have with us today Dr. Jonathan Kaplan, and he is a board certified plastic surgeon who has years of experience and gives incredible information when it comes to that process, what to expect, and really kind of taking back that curtain to understand what is all entailed when you go through this from that first start, start in your mind of, should I do this, should I not do this? Why should I consider this? All the way through to the very end, six months, a year post surgery and how you feel at that point. So we are excited to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take a look to see if Dr. Jonathan Kaplan has joined. I'm just gonna go see if I can find him in here. Okay, here we go. I'm going to pass in and let's get rolling as we wait for Dr. Kaplan to join us. This is an exciting topic. Please send us any questions that you have as we continue to work through this. Dr. Kaplan, hello. Great to see you, Sarah. How are you doing? Likewise, good to see you coming to us from sunny California. Uh, luckily, technology is working so far. Good, good. Well, let's roll. <laughs> let's get going into this because we Absolutely. have a lot to talk about. And it's a really interesting topic that a lot of people have questions about and just wanna know more about this whole process. So let's first talk about the undeniable, interesting 2020. How has this year impacted you and your practice? Well, we, we've actually been able to stay open the whole time. Uh, we do have an, our own accredited operating room in the office, so that was a little bit different because as you know, most hospitals, when there was a spike, they, uh, they stopped all elective surgery at the hospitals. And even though we are our own self-contained operating room in our office, uh, and we're not admitting patients to the hospital, they still wanted everybody to stop the elective surgery anywhere it was taking place. So our office operating room, we stopped operating from March 18th to May 18th. Actually, our last, breast, uh, last procedure was a breast augmentation and our first procedure back was a breast augmentation on May 18th. So for those two months, we were uh, shut down as far as operating in our office. But once we reopened, things were obviously weren't the same. We, uh, all of our patients, all of our surgical patients now, when they come in, They've already been tested in the community, uh, gotten their COVID test, and then the morning of surgery, we are uh, getting an antibody test on them. So we're making doubly sure that everybody's safe. And uh, so far, so good. Our employees have been safe. Our patients have been safe. So we're uh, still been still still going strong and actually really busy because, and even not, not just for cosmetic surgery, but this is really the best time for anybody to get any kind of self-care, whether it's a colonoscopy or a pap smear or anything that you've been electively been putting off, this is really the time to do it because you can recover from home. And that's kind of the way our patients feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, from our research at New Beauty, we find that people who are undergoing cosmetic surgery, specifically when it comes to breast augmentation, they're very empowered women. They really want to let their inner and outer beauty shine. And if there was a new stereotype about a woman who received breast augmentation, I feel like it's been disrupted, right? It's out the window. And I really feel like patients who are strong and empowered, there's no stopping them, right? A competent woman is on a mission. So from your perspective and your practice, what is the demographic like of women who are receiving breast augmentation? You know, tell us about them. Age, where are they in life and why they decide to do this? You're exactly right. There's no stereotype really that's associated that, that holds true anymore. These are not insecure women that are looking to get big breasts so that somebody will like them more. I mean, I, I think that's what this misconception people have. It's just not true. These are confident women. The people that we have coming into our office, they really fall into two different categories. They're the younger patients who are looking to get a straightforward breast augmentation just to, uh, you know, they feel confident on the inside. They just want to fill out clothing a little bit better. You know, the, their waist, uh, the clothing fits them in the waist, but it maybe doesn't fit them in the breast. The other type of patient that we're seeing a lot of are mommy makeovers, and that's uh, the older patients who have had kids that just want to get back to their pre-pregnancy state. And so a mommy makeover includes a breast augmentation uh, and possibly a lift uh, and then a tummy tuck, uh, you know, to kind of tighten up the abdominal wall. But when it comes to the breast augmentation, breast, uh, breast lift, uh, a lot of patients after breastfeeding, they have what I like to call pendulous breasts, possibly. 
They're very, uh, they can be droopy breast. And so in those cases, those patients, we will uh, do one of three types of lifts if they need it, aside from putting in the breast implant. Uh, we'll either do a donut lift to tighten it up around the areola. Uh, if they have a little bit more droop, then we'll uh, do a lollipop incision around the areola, and up a vertical incision. And then if it's even more droop, we'll do an anchored incision where it's around the areola, up and down and along the underside of the breast. So those are really kind of the patients that we're seeing, these mommy makers or the straightforward breast augmentations, which those patients are getting incisions either through the armpit or around the edge of the areola. And people often refer to this as going through the nipple. Nobody's going through the nipple on any of these procedures. It's along the edge of the areola or going under the breast. They all have their pros. All the different incisions have their pros and cons. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, to, to talk about that, I do feel like, you know, that stigma should absolutely be replaced with support, 110% for support for the women in the community, your friends, your family who want to go through this procedure, because there's a lot of different reasons and ways of doing it, as you had just mentioned. Right. If you want to look a little bit better in your bikini, there's nothing wrong with doing something safe to do that for right. yourself. Absolutely nothing wrong at all. Yeah, absolutely. More power to you, girl. So when it comes to the research, because you just, you know, shared with us, there's so many different options, right? So when it comes to research, what are people doing and how are they coming to you? You know, what references do they have? What information do they have? What are they armed with when they come into that consultation and how do you help prepare them? Well, to, to y'all's credit, some of them are coming in with articles from New Beauty. They've read a lot of New Beauty before they come in. But also the patients nowadays, as you can imagine, they're coming in with selfies, uh, not selfies, excuse me, they're coming in with photos from Instagram of other people's selfies. Okay. And they're coming in with those photos to show me what that, this is what they want to look like. And that's fine. It gives me some feedback as far as what they're looking for, you know, how big or small. But the thing, it also allows me to have a jumping off point in the conversation to explain to them that these photos are great that you're bringing me from Instagram. But the thing is, you don't know exactly how tall the person is in that photo or how short they are. For example, if they are five foot seven, 400, 450 cc implants will look appropriate. But if they're five foot zero, 400 cc implants might not look so appropriate. The other thing is from the photos that they bring in uh, as far as from Instagram is we don't really know how much breast, native breast tissue the patient had. So that's what they're, uh, they're coming in with. So if, you know, if they had a lot of native breast tissue, then a smaller implant might be appropriate. If they had very little breast tissue, then a bigger implant would be appropriate. But it's really great when they bring in these photos of what they're looking for and when they've done their research, because it allows us to have a very uh, in-depth, reasonable conversation to really address any reasonable or unreasonable expectations. Okay. So it is good to have, you're saying, have some pictures, because that almost in a sense helps you to understand what they're trying to achieve with their words. And so sometimes I can imagine what one person's vision of natural might be different than what you're thinking. And so having that image will help to then correspond to their body. And then as the physician, as, as your plastic surgeon, she'll help walk you through and say, okay, for you and for your individual body shape, this is what we think would be best. And you can work through all that with the patient. Right. And we're not really trying to tell them what to do. We just want them to know that, okay, if you want to go on the bigger side, then keep in mind that that may lead to some back pain. It may lead to uh, breast becoming a little droopy or a little bit faster. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, so we're not here to be anybody's parent, but we just want to guide them and so that they can do things in as safe a way as possible and also understanding the possible benefits and drawbacks. Right. So when it comes to that consultation, what, what is all determined in that consultation and what's all discussed um, that you have to, you know, share with the patient and bring to their awareness? Well, again, getting back to, you know, reasonable expectations, uh, certainly. And we talk about the different types of implants we can go into a little bit later. Uh, we talk about sizes and we talk about the operation itself and, and the whole recovery process. Okay. So if I can imagine that it's really good for them to bring in their research, understand mm -hmm. what they're looking for, <clears throat> maybe bring in some clothing, I have personally gone through this process and what I found to be really helpful was I brought in different outfits that I would wear. So there's your standard everyday outfit, then you, which may be like a workout outfit if you work from home, which we're all pretty much doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, it could be like a dress, you know, how do I look in a dress? So how do I look in a swimsuit? Because you are varied and there is a difference in how you perceive yourself sometimes depending on the clothes. And so I do feel like you really need to try on the different types of implants with all these different clothes to get a real true expectation of what it may look like on your body. 
Yeah, we, we at least encourage them to bring in a sports bra, but I am waiting for the patient to roll in here with a whole clothes rack of like 12 different <laughs> outfits to try everything on to see what, what if it fits appropriately and everything. But yeah, when they come in with their research, uh, we, we do ask them to bring in a sports bra at the very least. And then we go through the five, what I call the five decisions that we need to make together. Uh, one is saline versus silicone. Of course, I go through the pros and cons. Saline is a little less expensive. Silicone is a little more natural and what most patients do get nowadays. We talk about shape versus round. And just to kind of give you an example, you know, the shape, this is the teardrop where it's a little fuller at the bottom. And this is the texturing uh, to keep that implant in place. And we'll talk about the texturing a little bit later. And then there's also a round implant. It's a nice uh, round implant for a mentor, really full, nice projection. And the big differences with these two is that if patients come in, they'll say that they want to look a little more natural. And I was like, that's fine. We can do the shaped implant, the teardrop implant but it won't give you as much fullness up top. And they're like, oh, we, I want the fullness. And so that's when we mm -hmm. go towards the round, which may not be as natural looking because it gives you that fullness, but that's what patients like. And it, it does still look great. Uh, so we kind of go between the uh, shape versus round. We talk about the incision placement, what I alluded to earlier, as far as going through the armpit, the edge of the areola under the breast. Uh, we talk about over or under the muscle. Um, under the muscle is a little bit more camouflage. The other thing we found is by going under the muscle, it reduces the risk of capsular contracture. And what that is, is that everybody's implant develops scar tissue around it, totally normal. Even with like knee implants or hip implants, they develop scar tissue around it, totally normal body reaction. But by going under the muscle, it keeps that scar tissue at a minimum so it doesn't get too thick because if it gets too thick, it can distort the breast and that's called capsular contracture. So by going under the muscle reduces that risk. The other thing is the number five is the size. And that's where we have, we have different samples of the mentor implants that they put into their sports bra to see what looks most appropriate for them. And, you know, it's, uh, we just kind of want to make sure that they understand what looks comfortable on their body uh, and, you know, and kind of talk about the whole safety profile and things like that with mentor. It's a very, very safe implants. They've had these great 10 year studies where they've evaluated everything. So we reassure them that this is a safe procedure they're doing. Um, and then they basically make those five decisions and then we go from there and see what's the, it kind of really helps us hone in on what's the best choice. Um, also, Mentor has some sizing kits with gel inserts. We also can tell them they can go to breastimplantsbymentor.com. There's a visualizer on there. So they can have so much information even before they come in for the consultation and then we help augment, no pun intended, we help augment that information when, once they're there. Okay. That's really good. So it's really a five point analysis that you have to map out to then get to the implant that you and the patient um, feel is the best for them. Exactly right. Now, we're getting some questions coming through and we will get to them. And if we don't get them, we will answer them after this Instagram live because you only have a period of time before Instagram boots us off. Right. Um, but one of the questions that has come up is, you know, when you're seeking surgery, it's imperative to understand all aspects, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are the safety concerns with implants and what do patients need to know? Absolutely, yeah, so I mentioned already uh, capsular contracture, which is when the scar tissue gets a little thick and distorts the breast, and that's with all types of implants, saline, silicone, shaped, round. So patients need to know that, you know, putting something in your body and the body will have that reaction, uh, but the risk of capsular contracture is actually relatively low with mentor implants compared to other implants. Like, again, their safety profile over this 10 year exhaustive study, uh, they've really done their homework. Um, but then also the thing that maybe a lot of people who are watching have heard about, and I wanna get right into it. Uh, there's two entities, one's breast implant associated illness and the other is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So there's BIAI, so a little bit of word salad or a letter salad here today, abbreviations of BIAI, breast implant associated illness, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, ALCL. And there's actually been, uh, FDA has reviewed this and they've had a big discussion about this before the pandemic, which seems like forever ago. And they, uh, the, F, the upshot of it all of it was that, you know, they weren't taking implants off the market, nothing like that, because these things, these entities that are uh, the breast implant associated nails, ALCL, they're very, very uncommon. Now, if you get it, you don't feel like it's uncommon. So we have to be, you know, understanding and empathetic to that. But after the FDA reviewed all of this, the main thing that they had to say was doctors need to have provide great informed consent to the public, to their patients. And this is what that informed consent sounds like. So with breast implant associated illness, just to discuss it, explain it, is that uh, the patients who have it, it's, it's very hard to diagnose because patients have, they have weakness or they're tired and it doesn't happen right after they've had their implants. It might take months, years. 
And so it's very, very uh, nonspecific things that they're having, not disputing that they're having those uh, symptoms of weakness or uh, being tired or whatever, but we can't always know for sure if it's from the implant. And there's, unfortunately, there's not like a blood test that we can get uh, to see if that's what's causing the problem. There's certainly not a blood test before uh, they get implants to see if they maybe have an increased chance of having a breast implant associated illness. And sometimes the only way to really prove that they have it, and I say that in quotes, is because we still don't have a good diagnostic test. The only way to really kind of uh, help them with this is to remove the implants. And in that case, if the removal of the implants makes them feel better and that relieves them of their associated symptoms of breast implant associated illness, then great. That that cures them great. And uh, by removing those implants, if that's the right thing to do, then we can do that. And I've had one patient in my uh, entire 13 year career where she was having some symptoms of uh, weakness and tiredness and had to you know, get IV fluids and things like that uh, to make her feel a little bit better. And we could never really be sure what it was, but once we removed the implants, she felt better. Um, and so that's great. The other uh, uh, entity is the anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And that's not, it's not, a lymphoma is not really a cancer. It's um, kind of the scar tissue that builds up. I've talked about the scar tissue that develops around an implant. That's normal. But if it gets really thick and gets lymphoid tissue, the same material that's in a lymph node, that's a type of lymphoma. And the way a patient would know this, and this is much easier to diagnose, is that all of a sudden they'd get fluid around the implant. And so that a seroma, and you can actually draw that fluid off with a needle, send it off to the lab. It'll come back positive if that's what they have for a certain protein. So much easier to diagnose than breast implant associated illness. And then the cure for that is to take out the implant, take out the scar tissue, and the patients are better. The other th the thing that's interesting to point out with uh, mentor implants is in that 10 year study I talked about, they had no incidence of anaplastic large cell lymphoma associated with their implants. So again, I want to make sure people understand that these things exist. They're exceedingly uncommon uh, to the point of 0% in that mentor 10 year study. So we just have to kind of keep an overview of that. This is, you know, over, you know, over 98% of patients are totally happy with their breast implants and they're safe. We just have to keep an eye on the patients that are having those other issues, inform them during the consultation that that might be an issue so they can follow along themselves with, you know, self breast exams, making sure they're not missing anything. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the informed consent that I provide to the patient about those two entities, uh, reassuring that for the most part, patients do very, very well with breast implants. Uh, so it's, um, you know, I, I have personally not seen any incidences of the anaplastic large cell lymphoma uh, and knock on wood, as long as I continue using breast uh, mentor implants, which so far in that 10 year study, there was 0% incidence. The other thing that's important to point out is that even though this is rare, uh, the anaplastic large cell lymphoma, that it's specifically associated with the textured implants, which I showed you a little bit earlier. And the texturing, is typically associated with shaped implants to kind of keep that implant in place so that it doesn't turn. And the uh, implant that that was most associated with was a different brand that's now off the market. So just want patients to be fully informed that yes, these things exist, but very, very uncommon. And when it was happening, uh, it was usually mostly associated with one type of implant, not a mentor implant. Yes. So sorry about all that. Hopefully everybody captured okay. most of that information. Yeah, I appreciate all that information because I do think you have to provide the full scope. And, you know, from what you were just commenting on too is, you know, you have to be completely transparent with all aspects of it. And Mentor does take this incredibly seriously. And if you go to Breast Implants by Mentor, you can see that they have a very robust technical coverage on this. And so please do your research and look into this and understand it completely so that you feel comfortable you know, prior to your surgery and understanding it, or if you've had implants, this is a great place to go as a resource um, to find some technical, transparent information. Absolutely. So what tends, um, when people are making this decision to get breast augmentation, what tends to be like the deciding factor? What is the reason that the woman says, okay, I'm ready, let's schedule the surgery? Yeah, and I don't want uh, women to, or patients or the viewers to think that women have to have somebody else's approval, but with any procedure that you're going through, uh, cosmetic or medically necessary, you, you, it's, it's much easier if you have family support rather than people who are staunchly mm -hmm. against what you're doing. So it's nice to have that support. And there was actually a study by Mentor, they found that the patients, were who the patients who were going through this, 
they found the most solace and comfort from friends who had gone through this procedure before. So that's really what made, uh, made a big difference for them is that having friends kind of encouraging them to, or having somebody to bounce these ideas off, whether it was appropriate or even talking to friends about the size, the friends who had had the procedure before, that's who really was the most comfort to patients that were considering it. Um, that's good. Yeah, the, the other thing, you know, the other big questions are timing, you know, how much time they can get off work. And, you know, they're I always re let them know that they don't need as much time off as they think. You know, people talk about like six weeks off of work. That's just not the case. Um, and also cost. That's kind of, I don't want to say that's the only, that's uh, kind of the ultimate uh, issue is that whether they can afford it or not. And so for our patients, we try to make, you, you mentioned transparency, we try to make it as transparent as possible. So we ask them to uh, come over to our website. And if you don't mind, I'll just mention my website, uh, realdrbae.com, R-E-A-L-D-R-B-A-E.com. The patient can go there and they can actually see the cost of breast augmentation or any procedure that we offer uh, so that they know the cost ahead of time. So that they want and they come in. I mean, this is another thing I feel like with social media is that when patients come in for a consultation, that's, I mean, I'm happy to provide them all the information they need, but they really can have so much information by the time they come in. They can have information on the different types of implants. They see all their friends or people they know on Instagram or the, their, the people they know on Instagram who've had breast augmentation. So they can see the different sizes. They can see the different uh, looks. Uh, they can know so much, even including the cost, so that by the time they come in, they're really just kind of, it's the icing on the cake uh, because they can even know their doctor. They can watch them operate on social media, on Snapchat or Instagram, and they can really just know so much by the time they come in. Um, uh, to kind of see if that's appropriate for them and they can discuss it with their friends who have had a breast augmentation before. Okay, so you mentioned price and there has been now, I've seen a couple questions come through on the price. So just give us a range. Because I know it varies <laughs> east to west, mid, sure. you know, south. You're gonna have a range of prices depending on um, geography and then of course on what type of implants and the, the surgery you're having. But give us a range. What could somebody expect and what do they need to save for if they're considering breast augmentation? So if you're in the Bay Area, you can check out my website. You can check pricing there. I do not necessarily encourage people to fly from all over the country here. There's plenty of people near you that can do this. But I would say a range. If you're looking on a billboard in Florida, it's about $2,500. And that gives me the opportunity to mention how can a breast augmentation be so inexpensive at $2,500. They probably should keep in mind that oftentimes that's because they're not having an anesthesiologist there give you any kind of deep sedation or general anesthesia. They're doing the breast augmentation under local mm -hmm. anesthesia. Now, I'm not here to judge what other doctors do, but keep in mind that if you're going under what is an operation, even though it's cosmetic surgery, uh, and people tend to think, oh, it's not real surgery, it is absolutely real surgery. I know that if I was getting a breast augmentation, I would wanna be under some sedation or general anesthesia, I would not want to have that done under local anesthesia. So keep in mind that if you see something that's really, really inexpensive, they, they may be using, you know, real, you know, a, approved implants that they may be a, a board certified uh, plastic surgeon, but they may be doing it under local anesthesia. So keep that in mind. As far as if you want to get it with real anesthesia, uh, I would say the range is going to be anywhere from five to $8,000. Um, and there's plenty of good board certified plastic surgeons near you that that can provide you with a great service. They may have keep in mind that, you know, it may be in their in office operating room. Uh, it may be at a hospital that can make it a little bit more expensive. It might be at a surgery center, which makes it a little less expensive. But there's all these factors, the, the implants, the surgeon, the surgeons fee, the anesthesiologist, um, the post-op garments. Some people get cosmetic insurance included, and in, that's what we do. We include all the pain medication afterwards. We include uh, post-op scar cream. So there's a lot of different factors that go into the cost. But the short answer is five to $8,000. On the really low end, it's probably under low, uh, local anesthesia. If it's on the really high end, then they may just be a really fancy plastic surgeon um, okay. that's charging okay. a little bit more. Right. Understood. So really, you know, do your, have your consultations, check, you know, with your friends, get referrals, um, you know, plug for new beauty, look at our book and it will give you geographically the, the board certified plastic surgeons in your area um, with a form to look for and review to make sure you are getting a qualified surgeon. Um, and I want to speak to that too, because sometimes those lower price, you know, you have to make sure you're getting a board certified plastic surgeon um, to first to proceed with this surgery. Now, let's pull back the curtain a little bit in terms of what can be expected through this entire process. 
how do you prepare your patients to get started with this procedure? Right. So the one caveat I'll say is that, you know, everything I'll describe is what I do. So if you, uh, but if, you know, you want to obviously talk to the surgeon, you ultimately choose, talk to them about their post-op instructions and what they, what they feel like. But for me, which doesn't necessarily fit everybody's uh, plan, but for us, our patients, you know, they come in for their consultation, either virtually or in person. Uh, we go over everything. They have the operation in our in-office operating, accredited operating room. And then afterwards, they, uh, when they go home, we send them home with a little goodie bag. They have a, a post-op bra on. We have an extra one in the goodie bag. Uh, we give them their pain medication, their anti-nausea medication, which they sometimes don't even need, uh, antibiotics, silicone scar cream, and instruction sheet. We also send them home with several videos uh, to tell them that actually that night, because nobody ever believes us, so we put it in a video. We give them an instructional video that when they get home after taking a nap, we want you to take a shower that night. So, you know, anytime you've ever had surgery, everybody tells you, don't get the incisions wet. Well, my thought is, if you don't get the incisions wet and you kind of wait a few days, then you're just, the incisions are kind of getting grimy and sweaty. That can't be good for incisions. So that night of sur after surgery, we encourage the patient to take off their bra, throw it in the washing machine, take off all the dressings, all the gauze. And we have to reiterate this in our videos because again, they don't believe us. And then get in the shower and let soap and water run over all the incisions. Get your arm above your head, wash your hair. That helps work out some of the soreness in your chest muscles because if the implants are under the muscle, they'll be a little bit sore. So we do want them moving their arms because some people think, oh, if I move, it hurts, I shouldn't move. Well, then that means you're going to be kind of not moving at all and you're going to get sort of frozen. And once you do start moving, it's going to be that much more painful. So we do really encourage early movement, not bench presses, not, not saying bench presses, not push-ups, but just regular range of motion exercises of just moving your arms, washing your hair, and then that'll get rid of that soreness earlier. Um, and and I call the patient, check on them that night, and then that way I can really head off any unnecessary trips to the ER or going online, them looking up answers to questions. I just say, please call me, text me, send me a photo if you're worried about something, because that usually can alleviate any concerns right off the bat. Um, and then so we, we do have them do that. And it's, it's, it, it doesn't have to be this long six-week process, like I mentioned before. We encourage patients, you know, request two weeks off of work, but you may be able to go back sooner than that, or you just may want to take the whole two weeks off. We've had patients go jogging the next day. I don't encourage that, uh, but they did it, and they were fine with it. But uh, the main thing is showering with antibacterial soap, keeping those incisions clean, and, um, and just listen to your body. If it hurts, stop doing it. If it doesn't hurt, you can do whatever you feel like it's, is appropriate. Okay, that's really helpful. So each patient has their own journey um, that they're gonna go through with this process. And I do think it's interesting because I know speaking from experience that there's so much information you're taking in, right? And so the post part, you're like, what's going on? What's happening? Is this correct? So it is nice to have that correspondence or to have those videos or to have that information and be prepared with that because after you do have some very personal questions, um, of what is actually happening and is this normal, right? And, and I'm sure the doctors discuss this, but again, there's just mm -hmm. so much information coming at you that it is hard to retain all that. So it's really good to have those documents, those videos to support right. you. And you know, like that's you a, said, it's, the recovery a, is a lot easier, I think, than what people expect it to be for going under the knife. Um, but again, everyone's journey is different, but it is nice to know that it's not um, an extremely long process. You know, and you was, can start to feel better and listen to your body. Always listen right. to your body to understand, you know, where you can push it to, um, but be cautious of that and just allow your body to heal and work with it and whatever is going to make you feel good as you go through that process of healing. Absolutely. And I think there was actually a mentor study that showed that uh, patients were surprised at how much easier, I'm not saying easy, but how much easier the recovery process was than okay. they expected. Sure, I completely understand that. And there are some restrictions that we, you know, make sure that you follow, you know, that if you do get some specific um, restrictions from your doctor, depending on getting your surgery, it's going to be different. So make sure you follow those restrictions, follow those guidelines so that you do have an optimal recovery because you don't want to cause any more harm or have to have any um, issues post-surgery. Absolutely. We don't want you coming back to the operating room. Right, right. That would not be good. <laughs> so what can you expect for results? I think this is the big, like, okay, Let's get to it now. What is the expectation when it comes to results? When are you going to see the results? What's that timeline look like? And how long does it last? What does it like? Tell us more about this part. 
Yeah, I think that that's this is my favorite part because patients, when we tell them, you know, after the operation, they go home, they take a nap, and then they shower that night. That's the first time they see their uh, their breast, and they're they're really excited, and they 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 are also a little bit nervous because they feel like the implants are a little bit high at first, which that's totally normal. But mm -hmm. they see this that first night when they're getting in the shower after the operation, they're a little bit high, they're a little bit nervous. When I call to check on them, I can alleviate those concerns, let them know, don't worry, they're going to drop. And the, the term people use is they drop and fluff. They drop and kind of fill out. And some patients, after they drop and fluff, even though they were nervous when they felt like they were too high, they, they want them back up there. They like that full, uh, that full uh, upper pole. But, uh, but no, they do drop and fluff over the course of weeks to a few months. But you'll see your results that very first night when you get in the shower. And then over the ensuing weeks to like very few months, like the first three months, you'll really see that final result where they'll drop and fluff. And if you had the incision under the breast, that uh, the breast will drop and uh, cover up that incision. The incision around the areola, around the edge of the areola is amazing how well that fades because it's right at that junction of the pigmented areola and the lighter skin. And so that fades really well. And so that's patients will see that, that improve uh, over the course of weeks and months. But they, it, it, it's a very quick process, honestly, of the improvement and them seeing their final result. And they can start wearing bras, maybe not underwire bras if they have an incision under their breast, but they can really start going out and showing off their uh, their new assets uh, pretty soon after. Okay, yeah. I, uh, I have to comment because when I took off my bandage, it's like, whoa, what did I do? <laughs> because you, it was higher, it was bigger, swollen. Um, and so be prepared for that. I always tell people, you know, let them know that that's going to happen because it's like, did I make a mistake? And no, you know, after that time frame, no. it's incredible. Um, by the time you actually get to that point, you're like, this is great. This is perfect. This is exactly what I had wanted. And I talked to my doctor about right. it. So allow that healing time, allow that recovery time and that drop and fluff um, time to happen. When, like you said, it could be weeks, it could be a month. And that was one of the questions that we saw come through is how long is that timeline specifically? Now, tell us, this is something that I'm sure you've heard a lot of, but being in practice for as long as you have been, what are, you, what are the common myths? Like, what do people come to you and you say, okay, let's discuss that. This is a conversation that we need to talk about the entire part of this process, and we need to really get to the facts and, you know, work our way through these mm -hmm. myths. Sure. The, the first one is always, do I have to get them changed out every 10 years? And you don't. That's the first. That's the short answer. You don't have to get them changed out every ten years. What people are basing it on, though, it's not an unreasonable question. But what they're basing it on is there was uh, studies that showed that after, uh, well, Mentor was on the low end. That after ten years, that twenty-five percent of patients have to have some sort of reoperation. And reoperation doesn't necessarily mean anything bad happened. Um, the uh, it, it could be that they just wanted to get bigger implants. Maybe they had kids and they uh, the breasts were a little bit droopier and they needed to get a lift and then they changed out the implants at the same time. So 25% of the time at 10 years, patients get another operation. Uh, again, other uh, other brand implants uh, have a little higher. Um, so they think that they have to get them changed out, but at 10 years, you don't have to get them changed out. If you're happy with them, uh, then you can keep them. And I'm not necessarily saying they're lifetime devices, but if you're doing well and you're doing breast exams and you're getting surveillance, whatever that includes from your doctor annually, uh, just kind of checking on with ultrasounds and things, then if you're happy with them, they're doing well, you don't have to get them changed out. So that's one myth. The other myth is that they, uh, they, you know, they, they think that, oh, I won't be able to breastfeed afterwards. And if you're able to breastfeed before your breast augmentation, you'll be able to breastfeed after. Now people will say, well, what if I didn't have kids beforehand? Well, Theoretically, if you were able to breastfeed before your breast augmentation, you'll be able to breastfeed after. The, the point being is that even if we make an incision along the edge of the areola, we're never cutting through the milk ducts in any technique that we use to do a breast augmentation. So if you're able, those milk ducts aren't disturbed. So if you're able to breastfeed before, you'll be able to breastfeed after. The other is uh, that people are concerned about is the uh, liquid versus gel. They, they're afraid that if they, if they uh, rupture, if the implant ruptures, that it's gonna spill everywhere. The, the uh, gel is gonna go everywhere. And that's one of the things I want to show is that we actually busted this implant on purpose for a patient to see. And you can see the gel coming as I squeeze it. This is the gel that's coming out of the implant right there. But then when I release it, it goes right back in. And that's what these uh, newer implants is that these are what people call gummy bear. I don't think that's officially from the company or anything, but people refer to these as gummy bear implants just to show you that if there is a hole in the shell of the implant, that 
the gel really stays in the implant. It, 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 the implant can keep its shape. And so you may find out that you have a rupture with an ultrasound, but the point being is that they are not liquid anymore. They don't just spill all over the body. Um, and so again, as, as long as you're happy, you don't have to get them exchanged out. Just keep doing breast exams, self breast exams, clinical breast exams by your doctor. Um, and, um, and because you're going to be doing, you should be doing uh, self breast exams anyway, just be looking for lumps and things like that. And, and I'm not saying that you should go out and get, bre uh, well, one of the, there was a study out, I should say that found that with having an implant in place, a woman was able to fill a lump easier because there was that a little bit more firm interface with the implant behind it so they could fill the lump a little easier. So I'm not saying that's that's a reason to go out and get implants. I'm just speaking to one of the other myths is that implants cause cancer. That is not true. In fact, and there are studies that show that implants can actually help the woman palpate or feel a lump earlier than without implants. Um, so those are a, a kind of a mix of the different uh, myths that are out there. And then that's part of the consultation process is explain to them why those aren't true and why this is a safe procedure and safer than it ever has been. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate that illustration because that makes sense. Now that I see that with the implant, it really does give you that peace of mind. So thank you for that illustration. And My pleasure. Through the implant. Uh, now we do have a couple of questions. I know we have a, we have a couple more questions when I get to, but we do have a couple yeah. of questions and this is a question that keeps them coming up in one format or another, but it's, uh, someone's wondering if they're interested in a breast lift, but wondering if they need an implant or not, how do you decide what is best? Absolutely. So if the patient comes in and they already have a fair amount of breast tissue, and that's really just kind of you know, based on my exam and based on what they feel is a lot of breast, because a lot of times the patients will feel like after they've had kids, they've lost a lot of breast tissue. So they'll, they'll know best also. Uh, but if they already have a fair amount of breast tissue, and, but it's just a droopy breast, and then we can do a lift. And I can actually demonstrate for them during the exam that if I lift up their breast, it's like, this is what it will look like after we remove the excess skin with either that donut lift or the lollipop lift or the anchor lift I talked about. But after I physically lift up the breast during the exam, if they're happy with that shape and size, then they don't need an implant. But after I lift it up and the breast still feels flat, and some patients describe it as a pancake, if they feel like it's too flat, then that's appropriate to do an implant. They don't have to get an implant, but that will definitely help them with that projection. Okay. What about a fat transfer? That's also one of the questions that comes through. So you, you can absolutely do fat transfers, but I think that what most patients and certainly most surgeons are finding is that for that initial breast augmentation, that primary breast augmentation, the one that you've been you know, looking at all those photos of patients on Instagram and you want a breast augmentation, that look that you have in your mind that you want, that's not going to be uh, provided by fat injections alone. It's just, it's just not. It's, um, it's not going to give you that same projection, that upper pole fullness from, uh, that an implant will. You know, okay. fat injections to the buttocks work great. It's just there's different ligaments in the buttocks than, than there are in the breast. And so if you do fat injections to the breast, a lot of times it just kind of hangs very heavy down in the lower half of the breast, and it won't give them that result. So can you do fat injections? Absolutely. Will it give you the same look as an implant that you that you want? No, it will not. Okay. So when it comes to doing a breast lift, um, and this is a follow-up to that question that's coming through, is is the scar worse with a breast lift without an implant? Okay, so that's a great question because the implant itself can actually give you a little bit of a lift by itself. So if a patient comes to me and they have a slightly droopy breast, then we can put in an implant that's going to give them the lift that's going to raise their nipple to you know be in line with the fold behind their breast and that's kind of the aesthetically pleasing position mm -hmm. of the nipple so if we can do that with just an implant that's all we need to do and uh and so kind of taking that a step further that if somebody potentially you know would have needed to lift with that anchor incision and then we put it in an implant maybe they won't need that horizontal incision under the breast. Maybe they can get away with just the lollipop incision. So it is potentially possible okay. that with an implant, It looks like we may have frozen with Dr. Kaplan again. So here he comes. We have him back. Back. All I, right. I, have no, I have no explanation. That's all right. That's all right. Sometimes it's just difficult how this... Uh, but it was perfect because I had just finished my answer. So exactly. yes, an implant may be able to minimize the number of scars you have to get. Good segue. It just shows you how organic and transparent these conversations are, right? Okay. okay. So six months, a year later, 
what are your patients saying about their surgery? Tell us about the feedback that you get um, post post operatively. It's great because they they will be on a vacation. Like maybe I haven't heard from them. Like you know, we see a patient at you know two weeks later, and then three months later, and then we see them annually after that. And maybe it's been you know uh, six seven months since the last time I saw them, and then all of a sudden we'll get a message through Instagram of a picture from uh, from them, a selfie on a vacation in their bikini, so happy, so pleased, and encouraging us to repost their photo and to tag them even because. You know, it used to be people wouldn't want to talk about their cosmetic surgery, but luckily that taboo has kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, so that's really kind of the first time we get some initial uh, feedback from the patient after we haven't seen them for a while is they're on vacation and they're pleased with their results and, and they're showing off their, uh, what, what, you know, what they had done. Um, and then they'll also write us reviews, uh, but patients are very happy. They are kind of like, they wonder why they didn't do it sooner. I mean, they're just, they're filling out their bikini, they're filling out clothing, you know, whenever people can start going to galas and different, you know, nice events out uh, and about in gatherings, uh, they are, those uh, the patients are happy that they can fit their clothing a little bit better now. That's incredible. You know, what I do know, going through this process and talking to friends and with New Beauty and everyone who reads us, is it will have life-changing results. It just will. Because the art of improving your look and your self-esteem ultimately gives you and makes you feel great about yourself and you are a little bit more confident and you're ready to face the day and you know for me it kind of just reset a little bit of my compass in terms of providing time for myself you know two kids husband married work there's a lot on your plate so it does take a moment of like okay i need to give myself a little self-love here too and i became more aware of my habits so from eating habits, lifestyle, exercise, thought processes that we all have in our head. So it does set you on this new journey. And for that alone, I find it to be remarkable. So I might not be the person who's posting selfies in my bikini, um, but I am that person who will support women 110% with whatever they choose to do and be the reference, be the referral, walk them into the doctor with them, take care of them post-surgery, um, because that is what we need is really to have that support around whatever your choice may be. Absolutely. So totally thank agree. you, Dr. Kaplan, for this really thoughtful and insightful information and for really sharing how to navigate this process from the very early stages all the way through into the new life that you are living. Now, we do have a lot of questions, but I know we're kind of up to our time limit. So I do want to say that we're going to post this on our social media. We'll also have some engagement. I know Dr. Kaplan, you said that you will be able to engage with some of these questions. And if you are Absolutely. looking for Dr. Kaplan, you know, check out his Instagram. It's at real Dr. Bay, B-A-E. Um, and you can find some more information and um, start asking Dr. Kaplan some questions. New beauty, come test my questions. And I definitely want to reference the Breast Implants by Mentor as a great site, especially for a lot of scientific information. Um, there's a lot of information that you can find on there if you are thinking about this process. So that's a great starting point for you to start doing some research as well. Uh, and I just want to encourage people again, please don't message me through uh, Breast Implants by Mentor, which I'm speaking from right now. Message me through uh, Real Dr. Bay. Happy to answer any questions people have. Perfect. Yeah, we have three different operators going on here right now. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everyone. Stay in contact with some questions, and we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thanks Absolutely. to you, New Beauty, and to Mentor. Absolutely. Good to see you.